So hello and welcome. Happy Friday. Today is Friday, December the 17th, and this is episode number 138 of Backyard Beekeeping Questions and Answers. It's 45 degrees Fahrenheit outside, which is 7 degrees Celsius. Big windstorm came through, but it didn't hit me, thank goodness. But for those who did get a lot of wind damage, uh, our thoughts are with you. We hope that uh, you get recovery as quick as possible. So, if you want to know what we're going to talk about today, please look down in the video description and there will be links and further information as well as a list of all the topics that we're going to cover today in order. And that's pretty much it. So, I'm glad that you're here. If you're brand new, welcome for the first time. And if you're a returning viewer, thank you for coming back even though you knew that I was going to be here. I really do appreciate it. So, the very first question today comes from Nancy from Harleysville. Oh, wait! This is the way to be. I almost forgot to say that. So Nancy from Harleysville. When our colony is broodless, do the mites die or do they continue sustainably, phoretically, and continue a life cycle when the queen returns to laying? So for those of you who don't know, we're talking about the Varroa destructor mite, the number one predator of honeybees. It's a parasitic mite. And now, uh, when the colonies breed list, the mites don't die. I wish they would, because then all we'd have to do is make sure that the colonies breed list during different periods and uh, the mites would go away. There's more than one mite out there. Dr. Ramsey is talking about it. Tropa Lalaps. Look that rascal up. It's not here yet. It's not in the United States. But the Varroa destructor mite is, so that's what we're going to talk about. But Dr. Ramsey, he's the heat in the kitchen right now when it comes to Varroa mite information, but I want to tell you this really quickly. Phoretic, first of all, some people are like, Fred, what are you talking about? What's phoretic? Phoretic means the mite is not underneath a capped cell in with a pupae where they reproduce. Phoretic means they're outside in the open, exposed, usually on the body of the honeybee. And uh, they're big on the body of the honeybee. Very unpleasant when you see them, but they are contoured perfectly to match the abdomen radius. So they slip right in under the platelet, they stick their little mouth parts into the bee and they feed upon the fat body stores of the bee. So that's where they're spending their time when they're not under a capped pupae cell. So and the other thing is they reproduce two full cycles if they can get into a drone, which is the male bee. That uh, pupae will take the longest to develop. So the worker bee is number two. They get in there and they'll have one reproductive cycle. There's something called the foundress mite. So that's the female mite that gets in there and she's the foundress. She's going to lay eggs. Those legs are going to hatch. The first one to hatch is going to be the male. Then there's going to be a female egg that's going to hatch out. They're going to mature in there and if it's the only mite in that cell, then they reproduce the offspring from a single female, reproduce with one another. So, there you have it. The other thing is, uh, she climbs into that cell just before it's capped, while it's being capped, and she scoots right in underneath that larvae and uh, gets into the soup that is the, uh, the feed for the bees. And you would think she would drown, but nope. She's got this little breathing tube that sticks up through the surface of that liquid feed, and uh, that allows her to breathe and hide out underneath that larvae before it gets capped. It's a little, little bit of information there for you. So how long do they live outside? Well, if they're in reproduction, so if brood is present, actually that adult female mite does not live so long. She lives about 21 days to 27 days. That's with brood present. So she's wearing herself out. She's reproductive. But now we're in wintertime. So because we're in wintertime, there isn't a lot of reproduction going on, which means she's hanging out on the body of the bees. How long can she live then? How long could she wait things out? Well, several months without specific days being assigned to that. So several months they could live through winter in a colony and, of course, live off the bodies of the bees that are still existing there, wearing them down, inserting those diseases, those pathogens into those bodies of those bees, which is why whenever there's a problem with a beehive, the very first thing that people ask about, hmm, did you count for mites? Did you treat for mites? Did you verify how many mites were left after you treated? When did you treat? Was the damage already done? So this is, you know, everybody gets together. We start talking about the 
mites and the bees and their maladies. So getting mites under control is probably the number one thing that you can do to help stave off about 11 other pathogens that can spread into the hive. So you could see deformed wing virus on your bees and things like that. So that means it's already been instilled in the developing larvae. See what I'm saying? So to clear it out is a big deal. To get control of the mites while they're phoretic is a very good move. And there are some things that you can treat your hives with that allow you to have your honey supers on while you treat. But the best time of year to hit them up is during periods of low brood, like right now. So if you have a warm day, you can do it. The problem is with us, the warmest day happened yesterday, but we also had wind gusts, which defeats, you know, a vaporization application. So things like that. But anyway, to answer those questions, phoretic period, 4.5 to 11 days if they're in full brood reproduction. And of course, without brood present, 27 days and may live several months without brood. But the real question is, what happens when a colony dies out completely? What happens to those mites? So a mite in a colony, they can't live on a dead bee. Tropolalaps, that other mite, only lives 24 hours without a host. It's gone. It's done. So that's one of the good things about it. But the Varroa destructor mite, um, when the host dies, they're going to die too. Because they can't live without a host, because that is their life's blood, literally. They get into the plates on the bee, and they're feeding on them. So that's why when you have a dead out midwinter, let's say, and you don't discover that they're a dead out until spring, would there be living mites in there? No. But the risk is, this is the key, the risk is when you have a dying or declining colony of bees, and then there's a warm-up, and then the other bees in healthy colonies surge into that hive and rob it out. Any remaining mites on the bees that are still alive in there jump ship onto new bees, or the bees that are in the declining colony fly out and drift into other hives that are still going well. So it becomes what some people like to call a mite bomb. So they spread mites by spreading the bees through drift and also through robbing behavior and things like that. That's why if you have a dead out, close it up. Don't let anybody rob it out. Just in a nutshell, quick answer on that one there. Number two, Ross Millard, Pittman, Pittman New Jersey. Uh, you often talk about slatted racks, solid bottom boards, vented bottom boards, and trays. Can you talk about how you use them over the course of for the, the season? Or, for example, do you always use a slatted rack? When do you switch from solid to vented bottom boards? And do you always have a tray in with the bottom board? Or do you sometimes use it to increase airflow in the hive? So that's a lot of different questions. Really good for showing how to set up a hive in the first place. And whenever I hive a swarm, for example, I like to go over the equipment that I'm hiving them in. So I start with the bottom board, go right on up, support system, so the hive stand and things like that. But let's just touch on it really quickly. Here's an area. If you go to any beekeeping supply, so Dayton, Better Bee, Blue Sky Bee Supply, Man Lake, wherever you go, they all offer screen bottom boards, solid bottom boards, kind of hybrids that have a solid bottom board with a tray in it and then a screen above that. Some people have open screens straight to the outside world with nothing in between the screen and the ground beneath the hive. And so these are different ways people keep their bees. My preferred configuration, this is just for me now, see, right here in the state of Pennsylvania in the United States. I like solid bottom boards or because, for example, the flow hive back here, if you get that whole system, they have a bottom board encased. So there is a tray in there that slides in and is removed underneath an aluminum screen. And when the tray is in place, it blocks all airflow through there. Unless you open the back, there's a vented back panel that removes and has a closed or an open vented uh, position. And of course, the entrance becomes your primary vent. And that's true with a solid board or the screen bottom board with the tray that the flow hives have. Now, is there anything else? There is the Be Smart Designs screen bottom board with the core flute insert underneath the screen. And I don't like those. And that's because the core flute that slides in there 
usually gets stuck. It gets gummed up. They don't age well. They kind of flex and bend. And uh, at times, for example, when I might need to do an oxalic acid vaporization treatment, I have to be concerned about all the different vent pathways for the air to get out and for that uh, treatment to escape the hive. So I like the solid bottom board and, of course, the trays that are removable or reversible. You can flip them upside down, too. So those are my favorite configurations. You probably want more of an explanation than that. So the other thing is these open screen bottom boards, which are part of integrated pest management. Uh, they function the same, whether that screen is wide open with nothing below the hive, or if there's a screen and then there's a tray underneath, which is my preferred configuration. So if you're out there and you're a designer or manufacturer, and you're thinking, what can I make for the beekeeping community that everybody would want to have? Uh, to me, what I would like to see are more tray options and an entire enclosure there. So nothing from the outside can get into that tray and feed upon the things that fall down in there because you're going to get pollen, bits of wax, bee waste material, bits and pieces of bees, varroa mites that fall through, larvae from wax moths and things like that. And if there are small hive beetles, you might even find small hive beetle larvae down in the bottom. So having a tray that I can pull out because the tray slides in and out without getting caught in the grooves like the core flute plastic does. Because that core flute, core flute plastic that goes in there is just flat. There's nothing to hold anything. You pull that on on a windy day and your stuff blows off. You know what I'm saying? So I want an enclosure with a tray that goes in. It could even be like those lunchroom trays. You know, something like that. Maybe those were fiberglass. I'm not sure. But something that allows us to control what's in there and control the venting or non-venting and then be able to keep everything in it while we check it out and do our inspections. If you have a wide open screen for integrated pest management, then you also, for example, if you have a swarm in that, uh, the swarm, the pheromone goes everywhere. The pheromone goes right out through the bottom. So often you'll find the bees that are trying to find the swarm that you've just hived. They go to the bottom up to the screen and they're trying to follow the pheromone and they don't know where the entrance is so they collect underneath. The other thing is think of times of the year when your bees are bringing in a lot of nectar and they're making honey. That scent goes everywhere and that's why the wasps and robber bees and other things are following that scent and they're trying to get to it. So uh, more of the scent is in the air if you have a screen bottom board that has no enclosure around it. So now we have robbers taking an interest in the hive and everything can smell what's going on there. So if you have problems with raccoons, skunks, possums, or a bear smells it more, they're going to scratch at the bottom of that hive and potentially tear it open. So skunks claw at the bottom of things. So I don't like to see an exposed screen here in the Northeast, and those are the reasons why. So I think that's everything. I do have them, but there's, I don't think there's a, a lot of point in showing that. So the other thing is the slatted racks. If it's not a flow hive bottom, and if it's not a B-Smart design screen bottom, all of my hives have slatted racks, and there's a lot of reasons for that. The slatted rack, which is right here, creates a two inch space between the bottom board and your brood box right here. The initial thoughts for practicing and putting into play those slatted racks was we wanted to see if the bees would use more of the frame all the way down to the bottom because in general, when you go straight to a bottom board without a slatted rack, without that spacer, they don't use the full frame for brood. And uh, I would say that since I put the slatted racks on all of those hives, the brood now does go all the way down to that slatted rack so they use the full depth of that deep Langstroth frame and in some cases they continue their wax production right under the slatted rack and what we have here all drone cells down here so in a way the bees are actually because that's the first thing that other bees or wasps would encounter when they come into the hive they use the drones as protection. They get attacked first. Who cares? Bunch of male bees. So they're kind of out there as a cathodic exchange protection for the rest of the hive where the real brood is up above. So it provides a space, a little more venting space underneath if you've got foragers that are on hot standby. They can seek uh, shelter in the storm without being on the brood. 
You also have more space, like I said before, when you're shaking in a swarm that you've collected, they go right to the bottom and they fill that space underneath the frame. So that allows you to put all your frames back in right away, um, rather than waiting for your swarm to settle and, you know, you got to push frames in on top of them and all that other stuff. So it works really well for that. And that's pretty much it. Some people say for them that it can cut down on bearding in front of the hive when the bees are in max production and there's a lot of nectar drying going on inside the hive. Uh, but I haven't noticed big differences uh, in those with and without uh, in the amount of bearding that happens. So what else? We always have a tray in the bottom whenever I can and uh, airflow in the hive. So if I increase airflow, back vent on the flow hive. And of course, it's all the bottom boards. The increase of airflow would only be through the entrance by the size of the reducer that you use. Question number three, Shauna, South Dakota. Let's see, my question is about overwintering hives. From past sessions, I know you only insulate the top of the hive, depending on who you talk to. Uh, you get a different answer about insulation. I have heard that bees most often can handle the cold. You just need to make sure mites are under control and that they have enough food stores or make sure and give them emergency feed on top of the hive like you do in the rapid round feeder. I've been told that the only time bees have a hard time in winter is when it's very cold for a longer period of time where they are clustered very tight and cannot move to the food stores around them and they starve out. What is very cold to the bees and how long do cold spells are we looking at? Can they handle a week? Maybe two, three weeks? Do you have a good guess on this suggestion? I'm in South Dakota and it gets pretty cold in January and February most years, sometimes for extended periods. I was also told that by insulating the entire hive, I may be giving them a warmer environment, especially during a milder winter to move around more and that increase the amount of food stores they use and could increase the chances of spring starvation. What do you think about this? Here's what I think about it. There's a lot in that. But, um, and you're going to hear this a lot too. Beekeeping is regional. So you are going to, through the years of experimentation and your hive configurations, you are going to find out what works the best for your bees in your area. And you're going to pay attention. You can see what's going on. So we'll address one part first. Uh, what I like to have happen with my bees here in Pennsylvania in the snow belt where it gets cold and stays cold other than this year, and you get a lot of snow. One year we had over 100 inches of snow. Uh, I like them to, to get cold and stay cold, and that cluster, while they're there, um, consumes very few resources. So they're basically dormant. And they do migrate over the frames. And in spring, that's the key. That's when they start breaking cluster. That's when things start really kicking into gear. And that's when people have these starve outs. And that's because they get active and they will have used resources. But of course, what's the anchor that's keeping the cluster on those frames? Any brood that they're developing is going to keep the nurse bees over the top of it. So the cluster expands and contracts and expands and contracts, but it also moves up and they leave bees behind to stay over the brood that has to be warmed to 94 degrees, roughly. 94 to 97 is the span. And they have to keep that heat on them. Very few bees uh, can actually heat quite a few cells if they have nourishment, if they have carbohydrates nearby. So we have these fat-bodied winter bees, and sometimes when you pull apart a hive that did starve out in the wintertime, you will see bees nose deep in frames, in cells. And uh, there'll, there'll be a whole bunch of them side by side, and you'll have all their rear ends sticking out. Uh, next time you find that, and I hope you don't, but I'd like you to pull those bees out of the cells and look to see what's under them. Because what you may find is that those are actually the fat-bodied winter nurse bees that were doing two things at one time. If you have a, a cell of honeycomb, and you have a bee that says over the top of it, and a bunch of bees form a layer like a, like a living blanket, and they generate heat. That's one thing. Not terribly efficient, by the way, because you're using bees for insulation. Bees have hair. Bees trap 
um, they trap air in their hairs, and then that becomes the insulator, B after B after B. And then if we don't have air moving through, and that's why I have the no upper entrance, no upper vent in winter, air moving through takes this static air from around the bees and moves it through them. It causes them to cool, which causes them to activate their muscles, to heat, to burn calories. So without the air movement, they have more control. So the biggest thing is no air movement in the upper part of your hive. So for me, the only entrance is down below. There will be differences of opinion in application. So for those of you who have ever done any alpine exploring or winter survival and things like that, any shelter that cuts the wind, it suddenly feels great in there. You ever as a kid go out in the wintertime and get inside a big cardboard box like a refrigerator box or something like that? It offers virtually no insulation, but the minute you're out of the wind, you feel it feels pretty nice in there. So if you can, and the same for my chickens, chickens in the chicken coop. I don't heat my chicken coop. Some people do, see? But what I do make sure happens in the chicken coop is that there's no um, drafts so that the chickens who fluff up, Watch even the tiniest birds in wintertime fluff up, trap air, and then this is that becomes their insulation. So, and these are tiny birds, they're exposed, and they try to get under evergreens and things like that to cut the wind so they can hold that warmth in the air in their feathers. So the bee cluster is much like the feathers on a bird, trapping air, and it's our job to make sure that it's up to them to control how much air movement goes through there, and this helps them conserve energy. These bees that are going into the cells could be doing two things at once. The bee sticks its body in the cell, it generates heat with its thorax, and if it's a nurse bee, not only is it filling this because it plugged that hole. Here's the cell. Now underneath here is a developing larva. So that bee is doing two things. It plugged the hole, so it cut down any ventilation movement. It generates heat with its thorax. It's warming just that particular developing larvae, larva and it's feeding it. So it's using up its own resources, it's making itself dwindle down to nothing, trying to preserve the next generation, which is really what eusocial behavior is and why the beehive is a super organism. Expending resources, even to the point of dying, to preserve the reproduction of the super organism, the next generation of bees that will come out in spring. And that's why I want you to look because yeah, I just want you to look to see what's under them to see how bad things were. So, uh, we've had periods of eight or more weeks without a break here. So I know they can go that long. And there have been years where I thought that they were just dead. There's no way they could survive. I mean, they, they weren't doing cleansing flights. Uh, things weren't going well. There's no way. I mean, really. How could they survive that? And then the first few warm days that came around in March, end of February, the bees were flying and they were alive. And you're just like, how did they even do that? And that's before, see you mentioned here, that I know I like to insulate the top of the hive. Do you know when I started putting insulated covers on my hives? Just two years ago. I've been keeping bees since the winter of 2006, the spring of 2007. I just put the standard inner cover on there, the metal clad, telescoping cover they weren't insulated it was just the wood and wood three quarter inch piece of wood has like 1.7 is the r factor on that so basically nothing and back then because i read studies of you know survivability of colonies in canada we always look to these extreme situations for how we would you know get our own bees to survive so i had that little vent in the top it's a miracle that those bees uh were making it so, but that then, back then, what happened was they were also going through a lot of resources to be in a thin hive that had no insulation on top, inner cover, outer cover. The insulation was the bees themselves, so bee health was at the top of the chart. And then the stock of bees being acclimated to cold climates. Southern bees do not do well in northern climates. So the bee stock plays. And of course, what you hit upon here, the, the health of the bees also place. So now, two years ago, I put on, I used to have B-Max insulated covers on just a few of the hives. Two years ago, I put them on all of the hives. Now, I also have a lands hive that is going through winter this time for the first time. 
most insulated hive I have. It's uh, insulated with wool. And then the Long Langstroth Hive, horizontal. It's thick, but it's horizontal. Also insulated, because this year I insulated the cover on that. And now, this year, for all of the Langstroth Hives in my apiary, I have the insulated inner cover. Uh, because last year, when I had the outer covers that were insulated, those hives that had that, and my feeder shims on those, uh, they came through winter with a lot of surplus resources. So, in other words, they were no longer consuming 50 to 100 pounds of honey going through winter. It was more like 30 is what they needed to get through winter. So the more insulation value you offer the bees, of course, the less they have to compensate for heat loss. And so the fewer calories they consume, and when they're in a state of torpor, and if there's enough bees, if you're talking about a little softball size cluster of bees, are already in trouble, but if it's a big enough collection of bees, they uh, generate enough heat with very little consumption of resources, so it's pretty amazing. So, uh, when it warms up, that's when I worry about my bees, because then there's a lot of activity in there, and uh, they still have started brood, so they have to keep that warm while they go around, and they start moving resources around. But often they ignore, you know, the first and tenth position resources, or the entire cluster starts to migrate as they go up, so in the springtime, when you look at a colony, you're popping the lid to look at everything. Uh, here I find that the cluster has moved into the top box, and they're almost always in the southeast or just eastern side of the box. So the west side of the box, um, the farthest from sunrise, they uh, often have full frames of honey untouched, even those colonies that starved. So the critical thing, uh, the takeaway here is going to be to, to have a food resource as an emergency situation, like you mentioned here, the rapid rounds, although the rapid rounds, I'm pulling off half of the hives and we've put on fondant on half of the hives. So that is on top and it's kind of like feeding wild birds. If you start feeding your bees and they're using the resource that you put on top of that hive, keep feeding them. In other words, don't you dare run out. That's why I kind of panicked because the Hive Alive fondant people were out of stock there for a while. And I put in orders ahead of time, kind of panic orders, because I didn't want them to use up the fondant that was already there. And then me not have a fondant patty to put on top of that to replace it when they consume it all. So, so far they have not gone through a whole patty of fondant and I have my case of fondant on hot standby ready for that. So if you start feeding and provide that resource, because if they migrate up there and they hover right under that inner cover, which right now is an insulated inner cover, so they like to be up against that insulation. Uh, if I run out of the supplemental feeding up there, could be starving them out, dooming them, because it's very unlikely, unless we get a warm snap, that they're going to reverse direction and migrate back down towards the entrance, which is what they do in spring. They're not going to do that midwinter, and that's why Early in fall, you know, the losses that we look at are usually because of mite infestations or other diseases associated with the brood of the bees that keeps them from strengthening going into winter. And then of course, as you, let's assume that they're healthy going through that part, the next phase is spring when they're raising brood. So their heat generation goes way up because in low brood periods, the cluster temperature is way down. But when they have a lot of brood, that's more surface area to heat more energy gets consumed and we really depend on that cluster, which is now they're going to start to consume the resources around your hive. That's why spring starve outs, you know, you look in February, they look so strong, they're flying, they're doing orientation flights, we know we have new bees and everything else, and then uh, by the end of uh, February, first week of March, ah, they died. So, and it's really, it's 100% the beekeeper's fault if your bees starve to death. You didn't leave enough on for winter, you didn't seal up the joints in your hives, we cut down on venting, or those are pretty much it, and you didn't offer an emergency feed ration. So that's about it for that. Warnings for others, but as far as if, if they're housed well and it's well built and air is not flowing through their little heat capsule up in there, then they are going to do very well and they can last for weeks on end without a cleansing flight. Next one, question number four from Be Kind to Be Free. Do you put out open feeders with warmed syrup 
if the temps are high enough throughout the entire winter? I never know if this is helpful or artificially stimulates them. I would guess they continue to forage in warmer climates, so it would be all right for thicker two to one, so long if it warms enough and they are flying. Well, I don't normally. Because in the winter time, when we get those odd warm-ups, there's still snow on the ground and everything else, I go out to see the bees flying out, doing their cleansing flights. And you'll see them in warm patches, sunlit patches of snow. You'll see the bees land, and you get right up close with your macro rig that I know that you have, and you'll video their tongue going out, and they're gathering water from the melting snow. Some will do that on the landing board itself. They'll be out on the landing board, and they're getting as much water as they can, so that shows you that they don't have enough moisture inside the hive that is really in demand. So at that point, if they're flying, and we did those cold weather flying tasting tests, and I found out that cold syrup will ground your peas, warm syrup, they get what they need, and they fly back away right away. So this is actually a very narrow time frame uh, when you get a few days like that. Would you put out syrup for them? I will tell you this. I would not put out any kind of syrup for your bees in the apiary or immediately adjacent to the apiary. Uh, if they're going out and foraging, which again happens during the period when they start starving out, by the way. So would I put out something like ProSweet, which is what I was experimenting with? Because that was a very uh, great, that was a good opportunity to learn about what temps will they fly? What temps will they forage? And then, of course, um, what's the effect if they're going to drink cold syrup compared to warm syrup? So you want your syrup to be the consistency of honey because when they get back, just like those that are out collecting water. By the way, the bees that are collecting nectar and syrup are not the bees that will collect water. Those are different bees. Did you know that? So... The ones that are getting the water don't like pick up that bee and try to feed it syrup because they'll reject the syrup and because they're only water bees. And the reason for that is what good would it be for the bee to collect a bunch of water over here, put that in its crop, and then come over here and get some sugar source and dilute it with the water that they have in their crop. See how those things don't go together. So water bees have a different mission than the bees that are out after nectar. So if you provide something like ProSweet for a nectar source and you warm it up and we found out that above 60 degrees is pretty darn good, but I would put it at 74 degrees if you're going to put it out there because we want to limit their time that they're exposed. So if they're flying out and they find that source, these are scouts that find it and they get that syrup, we want them to be able to stay warm enough to fly right back to the hive and get that stuff in there because as soon as that forager gets inside, it's going to be mobbed. And uh, it's going to have to spread the wealth. And they're going to consume that. It's going to be ready consumption calories right there. It's not going to be stored. There isn't going to be enough of it. So, and again, this is northeastern part of the state or part of the country. But uh, I would not feed even two to one. It's too much liquid, in my opinion. So something like, the, it has to be the consistency of honey. So the only thing I would offer is pro sweet. Nothing to do with Man Lake. I'm not promoting their stuff. It happened to be what I was using for testing. And you don't need to put anything in it. And it is the consistency of honey already. So, And it's stable. It'll stay like that for a long time. So what I this year will be the first year I'm even going to try that. So when I'm looking at my thermometers, I'm looking at my weather station readout. And if I see that it's going to be 65 degrees someday or warmer, just for those that are already out foraging, Yes, I'm not going to put it in the apiary or no feeders on the landing boards and things like that. Nothing like that, just for the foragers and keep it warm so they're not grounded and frozen as they do their flights. Question number five. Be kind to be free. Wait, did you get two? You got away with two questions. Okay, we're expanding our apiary space and traditionally have used T post hive stands, or cinder blocks for nukes in a pinch. I noticed that you once used Lysen adjustable stands. Any reason why you moved to T-posts, more permanent stands, other than cost? Well, 
that's actually in reverse. So back in 2006, I thought it would be cool to hammer iron T-plus into the ground to use steel galvanized metal conduit as the supports. And then I put them on there with U-bolts. And uh, then I laid construction planks, the same planks that you use when you're building scaffolding, when you're working on houses. So they're really heavy planks. And I put that together. That stand is still doing great, as is the plank, even though I had to paint it later. So I actually started with the T-post thing because I realized I could have, you know, multiple supports and they would all be level and it could be as long as I wanted it to be. So I had eight hives on that. So I actually migrated in the other direction. The next thing that came along for a hive stand, I did use some cinder blocks. You'll notice that these days I use no cinder blocks, concrete blocks, whatever you want to call them. I don't use those anywhere. I have used those in the past. Be Smart Designs came out with plastic hive stands. So I got some of those. They're expensive. They're made out of recycled material, so it seemed good, green thing to do. But then I was looking at the skunks and stuff, and the B-Smart Designs plastic supports were not getting my hives tall enough, high enough away from the ground for the skunks. So then I had to put 2x6s on those, but now I've changed that. So what I use my B-Smart Designs uh, plastic hive stands for, they're sitting out in the bee yard all the time without beehives on them. They're lightweight, they're easy to carry, unless you fill them with water or you fill them with sand, you can do things like that to make them more stable if you're using those as your beehive. And I noticed that the Dice Lab at uh, Cornell University, all of their hive stands are those Be Smart Design stands. But I use them with a bottom board on them, a solid bottom board, and I carry that stand over and I put it right next to a hive that I'm inspecting, and that way, I don't take the cover and put it on the ground. I don't take a hive after I've inspected and put that on the ground or on the cover. I put it on this spare hive stand. So I have two of them out in the apiary. And if I'm doing any kind of inspection, I bring that over and that keeps my stuff getting all sticky on the grass, on the ground. I put them on these hive stands instead. Now, there's another kind of stand. So I use, uh, if you look at my horizontal long Langstroth hive, it's actually on angle iron. So when you're looking at soil and what kind of stand you're putting on it, we can have a compressional load or we can drive something into the ground and rely on a friction load, which is what I did for the angle iron. Those things go three feet into the ground. Because the horizontal Langstroth hive is easily a 150 pound hive before any bees or anything else go in it. So it's heavy, it's a beast. That's what I like about it too. You can make them as thick and stocky and strong as you want them to be. And I don't even strap it down when it comes time for heavy, heavy winds and things like that. So that was the angle iron stand, which I show in a video that shows how I set that up. The newest hive stand is actually the license stand. And I'll put a link uh, in the video description here. That shows, uh, I did a review of that when I showed how I was setting up another beehive with that hive stand. And those have telescoping legs on them. They're built for 1,100 pounds. So I can't imagine ever exceeding the load bearing capability of those. Uh, they come in pairs, you run two by fours through them. And uh, you'll see if you look at the video exactly how it works. So they just, there's a bolt that screws into the two by four and clamps it in place. And uh, those are the most adaptable, strongest, well-made hive stands that I've ever had. And I believe I have five hives supported by them. And I have others sitting in boxes because in spring, when I set up my nucleus resource hives, I'm going to have racks of those. And they are going to all be on the Lysen metal galvanized steel stands. Because uh, that capacity is impressive, but that's actually my newest stand. They're like a hundred bucks a piece. But if you make this comparison, so you buy a hundred dollar stand, well, those Be Smart Design stands are eighty-five dollars. So the comparison, hmm. So would I pay that much more to get these metal stands that are adjustable for uneven ground and everything else? Because the B-Smart stands have to be on level ground. You have to level the ground first, smooth everything over, and set them up, and they're going to be the way they are. 
these license stands adapt. You have four legs all at, you know, individualized heights. So, and I found out that if I don't have a structure directly under the beehive, things like skunks and uh, possums, they like to go straight up to the hive or they climb up the corner and go up the hive. And if there's, if it's just open and the supports like the license stands have or at the ends and the hives in the middle, they don't even try to jump up because they can't get their footing. They're not going to go up on the end and then walk on their toes all the way down and then get to the landing board. So it has a lot of advantages aside from the fact that it's basically unlimited weight wise. And you can put them in series because you can run the two by fours through them. So you could have six supports and you could have a 10 foot long hive support system. Although I have to say, the other thing that I'm doing as I'm adding hives is I'm trying to spread them out, the primary hives, but the nucleus colonies will all be in groups of four. So that's what I ended up with that. And those who want to see what that looks like, they could uh, look right through it. Because it says here that uh, ground is ridiculously hard. So if it's ridiculously hard, then I would put license stands on there. They're my favorite by far. If everything costs exactly the same, that's what I would be putting in. Because uh, even wind loads and stuff like that, they're not going anywhere. Also, they're not, the legs are not straight up and down. The legs are camphored. So that is a very stable hive configuration, hive stand. So, oh, I wrote notes about it here. Uh, the feet are 25 and 3 quarter inches apart at 9 inches high and 35 and a quarter inches apart or 23 and a quarter inches high. Height above ground is adjustable from 9 inches to 23 and a quarter. That's quite a range. So that's going to satisfy just about anybody. Of course, you have to put in your own 2x4s. And I got mine from betterbee.com. And I'm sure they're sold wherever license equipment is sold. That just happens to be where I purchased mine. Question number six comes from Brenda, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I've seen a lot of beekeepers posting their hives died, and they're asking why. They swear they treated for mites, but there was a lot of mite poop in the cells. Do bees clean out mite poop? And if they treated for mites, I was just wondering if the bees don't clean out the cells. This is what you find really when you have a dead out and you're looking at the cells and there's these little crystalline looking chunks, which is, uh, of course, barodestructor mite, feces, droppings, scat, whatever you want to call it. And uh, will the bees come in? If the bees survive, they'll clean out cells that have that in it, but usually you see it in a dead out because that's one of the first things that goes by the wayside when you have a declining colony, housekeeping it goes out the window. They're not dragging out their dead anymore. They don't have time to do anything else. They're in basic survival mode and they're expiring and their numbers are dwindling, especially when they're queenless and things like that. So, but if it was a strong colony, if you still had healthy bees coming into it, they would of course clean out the cells. Every cell gets cleaned before they use it again. But uh, yeah, that's a tell that they were overwhelmed and you had a mite infestation. And this happens a lot where people because it's a question, you know, I always ask if I'm talking about bees to a group or whatever. And even with my own Beekeepers Association, the Northwest Pennsylvania Beekeepers Association, uh, ask people, how many of you treat for mites? Fewer than half. How many of you count mites or look for mites? Fewer than half the membership inspects for mites. So they really don't know. The other thing is some people just do a treatment cycle and have never counted mites. They just do the treatment cycle and assume that, hey, it must have taken care of it. We, you know, we did Formic Pro for the two 10-day periods or whatever they did, and then I treated, so they're good to go. You have to verify. You really can't just expect that the treatment was 100%, that it was effective. So you really need to do a mite count to know what your mite loading was before treatment, and again, because it's the other thing, some people that even treat never count the mites. They just treat everything. So for your records and for your own peace of mind and for statistical analysis and things like that through the years, please do mite counts and know what the loading was at the time of treatment, the time of year that that occurred. Everything plays. Temperature, environment, size of the hive, history of the hive, stock of the bees, everything you know about that colony should be in your notes because... 
Some people will say, well, if you gave a couple of treatments, you know, of oxalic acid vaporization and, and you did it with this periodicity and things like that, well, that did nothing. That did absolutely nothing. We don't know that did nothing because you don't know what kind of integrated pest management strategies they're using. You don't know how much brood was in the hive at the time that they did their oxalic acid vaporization treatment, which may even be a single treatment cycle. And unless we count the mites, we don't know the efficacy. We don't know how effective it was. So if you don't count mites ahead of time and do a count after the treatment cycles, whatever it happens to be and whatever the treatment method was, if you don't verify by counting mites, you just don't know. You're just guessing. So, and I'm always amazed that people just don't count or don't treat and don't get involved in that. So, yes. Answer the question, they will clean those cells out if there are bees that are still in the upswing and not just dying out. Question number seven comes from Joe Elam. Is there any chance that wax moths or small hive beetles would destroy, attack a new frame with new hex comb from Better Bee? I think by hex comb we're talking hexacell, which is better comb. I was thinking of putting one in a swarm trap this spring, Tom Seeley. Said this Dr. Tom Seeley, by the way, Cornell University, said pieces of comb was not advisable in his article, Bait Hives for Honeybees. That article, Dr. Seeley, great guy, and uh, he's one of the instructors, of course, out at Cornell, and uh, has published great books and everything else, but this uh, Bait Hives for Honeybees, I think that publication came out maybe even in the 80s. So anyway, Better Comb did not exist when Dr. Seeley wrote this in the first place. But when we're setting up bait hives, this is a great time to talk about this anyway, because those of you who are settled in for winter need to be thinking about the bait hives. What is a bait hive? That's to catch swarms in spring. Scout bees are going to be going out. The same ones that are looking for water, same ones that are looking for resources and things like that are going to be exploring trees, windows. They fly up to your windows in the wintertime on a warm day. They check the gutters. They go everywhere. They're looking for housing, so, ahead of time. So, Dr. Seeley did a lot of great research, much later than this, and uh, offers great advice. And, of course, the size of your swarm trap should be roughly the size of a 10-frame deep Langstroth box, which I think also those nucleus colonies, the five frames, and then a second-story nucleus, five over five, that has the same volume. And I think because of its vertical configuration more appealing to the bees. So uh, what should you put in it? So the better comb, I don't like to waste better comb in there, but I could put one or two frames in there and would wax moths get in there and consume those? And uh, the answer is no. And that's because they don't get anything out of it really. There's nothing to entice them in there. So the reason a lot of people like to put comb that they don't mind losing right? I mean, the bees, the scouts are not going to move in and occupy a hive that is actively netted all up. There's a spider webby looking stuff all over comb that's being eaten by wax moths. So wax moths like enclosed spaces, and it's a great way to get rid of your old comb because some people put old comb that you're going to get rid of because it has such strong reproductive scent in it, and it tells the scout that this has been occupied before, and you can move in and occupy it now. Because we're talking about spring swarm capture. So this is a difference I want to make on this because I can't talk to Dr. Seeley. I don't know what he was thinking, you know, 22 years ago or whenever he wrote that. But um, <clears throat> we have May through July in the Northeast. And for Dr. Seeley, that was in New York State. He talks a lot about the Arnott Forest. So in early spring, uh, we don't have a big wax moth problem. So when you're putting your stuff out in spring, the wax moths are not flying, therefore they're not laying eggs, therefore we don't have wax moth larvae to worry about consuming these frames. So the spring swarm traps, I would say, put your old comb in, put your better comb in there, whatever it takes to make it enticing to the, to the scout bees. You can also save Ziploc bags full of propolis scrapings and things like that from when you're inspecting your hives and sprinkle that around on the bottom. And the person that suggests that all the time is, of course, Dr. Leo Sherishkin of Horizontal Hives. So you put all these things in there to put this scent in the air, and that is just as good as using something like Swarm Commander. 
Now, a swarm commander, if everything you're putting in there is brand new and doesn't smell like it's been occupied before, you're a brand new beekeeper and you're trying to catch your first swarm and you don't have a bunch of old comb and propolis and scrapings and things like that to put in there, swarm commander, lemongrass oil is in there. Uh, but I understand swarm commander is more than just lemongrass oil. A lot of research went into that, which is why it's the number one lure for swarm collection and enticement. So if you're brand new, Swarm Commander, if you've got these other resources, use Old Comb and bits and things like that. Now let's fast forward and go to August and September when swarms also happen. Some people like to catch uh, swarms at that point. Now it's hot. Now you have the potential for the wax moths to be flying around, laying their eggs and consuming uh, old frames and comb that are in storage that are protected from the weather that are isolated. That's why we keep our wax moths out when we have stacked supers that are ventilated and they're 90 degrees to one another so air flows through them. Wax moths don't even develop in there. Uh, but so at the end of the year when things are hot and you've got your uh, wax moths flying around laying their eggs and the little larvae, the wax worms are getting in there and eating everything, which is by the way the natural course of how feral colonies that are abandoned for one reason or another, the wax moths get in there and they consume everything and then a new swarm of bees moves in and they start to build brand new comb. And that's the way that they make sure that they're not using really old age comb that really has concentrated a lot of toxins from the environment, primarily from agriculture and even from beekeeper treatments. Uh, these toxins build up through the years in the honeycomb in the beeswax itself so actually it's a good thing that wax moth larvae get in there and consume the old uh, comb and get that out of the way because they can ingest and process even plastic it's been discovered that uh, they digest it and break it down and that's so that the new feral colony that occupies that old bee tree gets in there and builds new comb from time to time so it's a good good service that they provide there so that's what I would say to that. Yes, you could put better comb in there. It's expensive, but uh, used comb is more enticing to the bees. Do not put capped honey in there. Don't put um, things that would attract small hive beetles and things like that. So don't put in bee bread. So if you've got stored pollen and things like that, don't try to load the cupboards with resources for the bees. Just provide them with the structure and they'll bring their own resources in there. Question number eight, Deb from Grassy Creek, North Carolina. We're planning to move a hive this winter, but not sure the best way to do that. The ground between locations isn't far, but it is quite uneven and bumpy. We're thinking we'll probably have to pick it up and move it by hand instead of some other means. Since the hive weighs around 75 to 100 pounds, it's not actually too bad. Can you recommend a good way to secure it while the two of us are moving it? Thanks so much for your advice. Same way that uh, I secure for wind. Ratchet straps. If I were going to move a hive and keep it together and want to make sure that nothing falls apart in transit, I would pull, if you have a telescoping cover on your hive, uh, I would take that off, leave the inner cover in place, and I would put something, of course, to cover that center hole if there's nothing already in place for that. And I would strap the hive with two shipping straps, really snug. And then uh, you'll be able to move it without tipping it one way or the other. You can put two by fours under it, bring more people than you think you need to lift it. It's only a hundred pounds, but it can be awkward. Have your hive stand set up and leveled and ready to go, obviously. I mean, I don't want to be condescending at all, but some people start to move stuff and that's when they start shifting things around and trying to level stuff up and then they wait to see, you know, what angles and directions they're going to face things. So all the prep should be done, but 100 pounds is not bad at all. You know, two or three people could pick that right up. So what we really want to do is keep the boxes from separating. We don't want to break the propolis seal. So ratchet straps or ratchet that right down just like you're doing shipping. Uh, if you had a taller hive, let's just say for those who might be listening to this and they have a taller hive, they don't want those boxes to come apart. Not only would I strap the height, all the boxes together, but I would run two two by fours right up against the back. Usually you can't do it against the front because you've got a bottom board. We don't want the bottom board to fall off either. That's why it's included in the shipping strap. 
So then you run the two two by fours as close to the corners as you can on the back, and you run two straps, one at the bottom and one at the top. Now we can tip the whole thing back and we can all carry it over and then set it upright again. Because when you're putting it on another stand, the bottom needs to be clear. And that's why you have to consider that too when you're putting your straps through the bottom. So you have to be able to shim it or something so that you can remove those straps. So all these things are considered. And then of course, there are those really expensive hive moving pieces of equipment which I don't have. Haven't, uh, I've always thought that somebody needs a really cool hive lifting moving kit of some kind. But I would just strap it up and manhandle it into place and just keep the boxes from falling apart. And don't be afraid to tip it back because uh, things are not going to spill out this time of year and the bees don't care if you tip them. So if that works, let us know what you end up doing. Post pictures. Go to The Way to Be Fellowship on Facebook. And if you've found some cool way to pick up and shift and secure a hive with all the bees in it, you just want to move it 20, 30 feet or whatever, if you've got a cool mechanism for doing that, please share how you do what you've done and what you innovate, uh, because that's a good fellowship there. This one, question number nine from Nurse Steve. I'm a beginning beekeeper in San Antonio, Texas. I don't know why I think about Pee Wee Herman when that comes up. I have two hives. The Alamo has no basement. Um, I have two hives that just don't seem to be taking off. The first hive swarmed last year, and I replaced them with a nuke of bees from a friend. And then established a second hive with a nuke from a keeper up north. Both still have bees going in and out, but I'm not seeing any growth or new wax being laid on the empty frames. I'm being told that bees won't lay comb on the plastic frames unless they are pre-waxed by using melted beeswax on a roller to wax the frames. Is this the case? Okay. Actually, it is the case. Um, I mean, bees can and will build their wax uh, and they draw it out, we like to say. So bees will attach wax even to shipping containers. So the bee buses, those plastic bee buses, you'll see bees build wax on that. Those aren't primed. So they have the ability to build wax off of any surface, the interior of your hive, the edges of wooden frames. They build wax on a lot of different things. Interior surface of your insulated inner cover. Look at the beeswax on this thing. They built comb on that. That was not primed with wax. So would they build on other materials that are not primed with wax? They could. What's their preference? The bee's preference is, and they're enticed to work surfaces that have beeswax on them. And the more beeswax that exists on the surface that we want our bees to work, the better. So, but they will, they have the potential and the ability to work on any surface and attach their wax and start building from there. But if you're seeing, like you put in a solid frame of plastic, now this one already has, notice how this is kind of looking white. See, there's a white film on there. That's called the bloom. Real beeswax begins to develop a white surface on it, and that you really know that that's real beeswax then. But when we've put in frames like this, plastic frames, with no wax preparation on them at all, sometimes you'll notice that the bees will start to build their wax on the back edge of one of these and they'll draw it down parallel to the surface and frustrating to the beekeeper they will not attach it to this surface and instead they draw a double comb super annoying but then when you look at the the frames and the plastic that they've done that to it's usually because there's either no plastic priming no wax priming on the plastic or not enough it's either too thin or non-existent. So if you can roll it on, I mean, I see a lot of people do that and it's easy to do. You know, they heat the wax up, hopefully not overheating it either. So heavy nap rollers, people roll it on there and put it, get a good coat going because once they've started, once they've begun on a surface, uh, they'll continue to work that surface and expand the comb. So to answer the question, they won't 
lay comb or build comb on the plastic frames unless they're pre-waxed. They have the potential to, and they've demonstrated that they will, but they will do it much faster, and you'll be helping your bees along if uh, you provide a nice heavy coat of wax on the foundation ahead of time. That's been very well proven, and uh, if you put a frame with no foundation, no beeswax on it at all, everything being identical, and the next frame over here, heavily primed with wax, they're going to work this one first. So, there you go. But they'll build comb on a tree branch for Pete's sakes. So, they have the potential, but we're trying to encourage them to go a very specific way. Question number 10 comes from Russ of uh, New Brunswick, Canada. Hoping to get into beekeeping next year, and I'm wondering, wondering how close my hives can be to my chickens. I have a large fenced pen for chickens that is in the most protected part of my yard. Would the free range chickens eat the bees or could the bees attack the chickens? Can they get along in the same space? Okay, so two things are kind of mentioned here in this question. One is that there's a pen for the chickens and the next statement is that they're free range. So I have another website called freerangechickens.org because I'm also a poultry technician. So chickens are my thing. Uh, so here's the deal. If you're going to put them anywhere near, um, I don't like the idea of having your beehives immediately adjacent to a chicken coop. Uh, but if you, if you create enough space and any farm animal, not just chickens, make sure they can get away from the bees. Uh, I had concerns and some people are saying, Fred, why didn't you... Why didn't you put your beehives in this in this lot that you have down here in the past? Why didn't you start out right there? It's a great lot. Well, I didn't do that because that's where my myotonic goats were living. So if you don't know what a myotonic goat is, those are Tennessee fainting goats. Now, a fainting goat next to a bunch of beehives is a disaster in the onset. And that's because you go like that at your fainting goat and they go peg-legged and they fall over. So if a bee flew over and stung the goat and he fainted, now he's just a sitting duck for the rest of the bees to come and sting him and he wouldn't be able to get away. So livestock should be separated from your beehives. And uh, also, there should be no confined livestock that can't get away from your bees uh, right next to your beehives. Now with that being said, my free range chickens, which right now, if you want to take notes about chickens, you don't have chickens, you're thinking about something to start with this spring, other than go and get the DVD titled Regarding Chickens, Three-Hour Guide to Backyard Chicken Rearing. Freerangechickens.org. Anyway, uh, when your chickens are free-ranging, I'm using Menorca chickens right now. Menorca chickens are the best foraging, ranging birds you can get to date. And I've had so many different breeds of chickens through the years. And as a poultry technician, I've been to a lot of different poultry operations and I've drawn blood from all these different breeds, all these different types of birds. And uh, I've even raised Australian emu and things like that. So the Menorca is a great free range bird. Now, what do they do is they troop right through the bee yard daily, multiple times a day. And they're picking up every little bug, every little moth, every little thing that they can find. And they do this all day long. It's true free range, unrestricted. There are three chicken coops that they each go to at night. And they're secured at night, but they're never confined. So there's no chicken pen, per se. Um, so they also don't eat dead bees because I watch them. When they come through the chicken yard, I actually thought it would be a great idea if they ate animal protein in the form of dead bees when they're laying around on the ground in front of the hives, especially in spring and stuff when there's a lot of cleansing going on. They don't, they just go through and eat everything else. Now, African guineas, so the guinea fowl, pearl guineas, lavender guineas, whatever kind is your favorite, those will eat the dead bees on the ground. So they'll come through and they can fly. So again, that's a bird that is pretty simpatical simpatico with your bees and they'll eat the dead bees they don't go after any of the live bees and they have the ability to fly away and get away and they, they prefer to run however 
And if you're thinking of a bird and you want your ground to be quiet and you like your landscape to be silent, then uh, guinea fowl are not your choice of birds. But so that's kind of if you're planning things and you haven't got your bee yard set up yet and you have livestock on your property, wherever your livestock roost or sleep or are housed or confined, I would consider those spaces and make sure that they're well away from your beehives. Just in the event that you get a hot hive, you don't want them attacking chickens because bees can go after chickens and they go after the ones with the darkest feathers first. And uh, we had a neighbor, a few miles by neighbor, you know, a few miles down the road. She had a hot hive one year and the bees did attack the chickens and they went after one chicken in particular and they covered the chicken with so many bees that only the feet were visible. That's an extremely rare occurrence, but uh, these are the extreme potentials that if you're planning things out that you should be thinking about. You don't put your horse barn right there. Even Langstroth himself said, make sure your sweaty horse is nowhere near your beehives when you're working your hives. So, a lot of interesting stuff like that, but uh, they won't eat your bees. I think they just instinctively know not to ingest something that's got a poison um, load in it, a venom load. Question number 11 from John Mitchell. I've just watched a very instructive lecture, Reading a Hive, by Kirsten Trainer on the National Honey Show channel. I'd really like your take on the top three reads for a beginning beekeeper. What are the top three things I need to read when I open a hive? Thank you for sharing. Well, thanks for writing, John. So here's the thing. Um, I did a lesson this past year of how to inspect a hive. And it happens to also be the Long Langstroth Hive. So I will put a link uh, to answer question number 11. There'll be a YouTube video link there because I think for me to sit here and tell you what I'm looking for, I will give you a cursory uh, thing about what I'm really looking for. Uh, but in that one, I go through the whole thing and it's a 40 minute video that shows you everything inside, including the queen. But what I look at uh, when I'm drinking my coffee and I'm wandering around the bee yard I'm going to look at a hive. They're very, you know, here's the advantage of multiple hives, by the way. When something's different about one hive, you notice know pretty much right away because it's not behaving like the others. So you always look at the landing board. You look at the landing board to see what the activity's like, what they're doing, and guess what else we do? We look at the ground in front of the landing board. And we look to see if there's bees on the ground. Were they just tossed out? Did, you know, is, did the snow just melt and reveal a bunch of dead bees? Are there live bees on the ground? If they are, what are they doing? Are they trembling? Are their tongues out? Uh, so there are a lot of things to learn from looking around the outside of the hive. The other thing is listen to them. So we listen to the sounds that they're making. We look at the pace of the work that they're doing there. And when you open your hives too, the sound that they make. Some bees, actually, the colony seems restless. They, there's a little a little roar, a little rush that comes out of them when you open the hive. And others, you open the lid and there's nothing going on. They're just quiet. They act like they don't even care that you're there. So listening to them as well. And then we're looking for, you know, the number of bees in the hive, how well they're fed. How, what are the resources looking like? We're tipping the hive this time of year. Is this hive really light or is this hive still loaded with everything? So all of these things inform us about what's going on with that colony of bees. And so, like I said, I'm going to put a link in there. I hope you'll watch it because I show you what eggs look like. Uh, are they being fed well? Brood patterns, things like that. So it's a pretty good assessment. But when you get into the hive, of course, the first thing you're looking for, too, is are the resources in line with what's going on this time of year? Are they keeping up? Lots of honey, enough uh, brood. Are there eggs? Does it indicate that the queen is present? So I'll just put that link down in the video description and you can watch the whole thing. And then let me know if you still have questions after that. <clears throat> Number 12. So the last question of the day comes from Kathy Hathaway. Hello Frederick, I have a question about your fondant. You were talking about the bees are being already up and eating the fondant. Is this because the fondant is better than the honey or the syrup? If this is so, does it mean that the bees have moved up and they will not go back down to get the food that is below. 
So will this cause the bees to starve because it will not go back down? I guess I'm talking about a hive with a few boxes on it, most of all. So there's some truth to this. <clears throat> and it is a concern that I have this year, and that's because with the insulated inner covers and everything, my bees have migrated up uh, towards that top a little bit earlier than they historically have in the past. And this is going to be the same philosophy that you apply when you're feeding wild birds and things like that, for example. Once you start feeding and making those resources available, you can't stop mid-stride. So, with your beehives, if you've put fondant on, which I did, <clears throat> the fondant we're talking about, and it seems like everybody's talking about it right now, is the Hive Alive fondant. Cut a hole through this label side. Put it down on top of the insulated inner cover, and then we see the bees up here eating it. Once you start, and this gets consumed three quarters of the way, four fifths, whatever, be ready to put a new one on uh, because you're going to peel this up, put another one straight on, <clears throat> get the bees fed, and keep them fed because there is a risk that they've risen to the top without a warm up. Uh, they would stay up there where the food is, where the brood is underneath the cluster. They may fail to move back down. There's no incentive for them to move down to the colder part of the hive uh, unless we have a warm-up. So if temps rise into the 60s and stuff, they will spread out, but as long as they're anchored by brood, they're going to remain there. So the key to that is, whether it's dry sugar, sugar brick, fondant, whatever you've put up there, uh, make sure it's continuously available to them or they may in fact starve. So it's a very good question and it's very important. If you start feeding, keep feeding because you have actually encouraged them to move up near it. It's not so much that they prefer it over stored honey or syrup, whatever was mentioned here, but once they establish in part of the hive and there's a resource, they tend to stay at the resource. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I hope that answers that question. If you start feeding, keep feeding. So I want to thank you for being here today. If uh, you're having trouble keeping track of all these videos, don't forget to click the like button down there so that you know that uh, you've seen it. And if you want to know where you can find a list of all these videos put together, there's a page on my website uh, where it's broken down. There's a PDF document that breaks it down by subject matter. So if you want to see all the topics that have been covered and which videos it's associated with, you can do that. The website is fredsfindfowl.com. You can also go to the YouTube channel and look at the playlists and pick the playlist that is questions and answers about beekeeping. And so each time, if you subscribe to the playlist and save it, then every time we add a video to that, uh, you'll automatically get the alert. So I want to thank you for being here today, and I hope that you've got a fantastic weekend ahead. And you better have done all of your Christmas shopping if you're trying to get something by next week, because we have one more Friday between now and Christmas. So thanks for watching. I hope that you have a great beekeeping day.